In Matthew 9, the woman with the issue of blood is not named, but Jesus calls her daughter, and her life is transformed. I'm Holly Wagner, and today on Better Together, let's join Lori Crouch, Christine Kane, Crystal Evans-Hurst, Havila Cunnington, and Onika McCullen for a powerful conversation on how to see our identity and value through God's eyes. I love the fact that the scripture is full of so many women um, that are unnamed. We, we kind of know their issue, but we don't know their name. Like you have the woman with the issue of blood. We, we don't know her name, but we know her issue. There's the woman at the well. We don't know her name. There's Lot's wife. We know she's Lot's wife, but we don't know her name. I'm thinking there's, we could go on and on. The women that traveled with Jesus, that we don't know their name. Um, and. I'll tell you why this means a whole lot to me. When I found out at 33, so that's about 22 years ago, that I was adopted, so it's a pretty freaky thing to grow up 33 years um, thinking you were biologically uh, related to your brother who was six foot six with curly <laughs> hair, and I'm five foot two with straight hair, as we can tell. And my younger brother, I mean, now you look that's at it amazing. and go, uh, maybe which one of these is not like the other? But anyway, at the time, um, we thought we were all biologically related. Then we find out we're adopted about a year after I found out I was adopted. So now I'm um, about 34 years old. I had um, written to the Department of Community Services in Australia and asked them for my um, my documentation, which is a really weird thing to get your birth certificate and to get social work reports at 34 when you thought you had them your whole life. Mm. So I remember. I had done pretty good with the adoption um, news and had been processing that with my mom and my family. And then I was at home alone, Nick was at work and I had come home for something and I was there when a special delivery package uh, came to my home in Australia. And I opened the door and I could see it was documents from the government. And so I sat down and I opened up the envelope, I'll never forget this, and I pulled out like the papers just like this and I started to read. It was so weird because it was my, it said birth certificate, particulars of child prior to adoption. So even that, just to kind of look at that was like, wow, okay, this is it. And I start going down the list and it says, child's name and then in the box next to the category for child's name, simply is typed in the word unnamed. And then under that, it says uh, number 2508 of 1966. And I just remember, I, I, was, I stood there like frozen. Of all of the news that I'd heard that year and processing everything, nothing was more like a knife into my heart mm -hmm. than that, than just to see unnamed yeah. 2508 of 1966. And I, I started to cry and, um, and simultaneously it was like a tape recorder started. We've all got that tape recorder. So in my ears, you know, it was like the enemy's whispering, see, Christine, of course your mother didn't want you. Uh, she didn't even give you a name. You're just a number. No wonder you were abused. No wonder. I mean, all, all that just starts, that tape recorder that just starts going. And I remember I was um, crying and I'm holding it. It was like I was like just frozen. And in my heart, I um, just felt a prompting from the Holy Spirit. And the Bible uh, was sitting on the living room table where I was sitting um, because I was going to prep a message. And the Bible was there. And I felt the Holy Spirit. I don't even know. I could not make this up if I tried. Say, so Christine, um, open the Bible. It was the New King James Version. And it was open the Bible to Isaiah 49, um, verse 1. I didn't even know this scripture was in the Bible. This is before I went to seminary or anything. So man, I, I was not that often in Isaiah. So I'm, I'm going to Isaiah 49 verse one. I'm holding the paper here. I'm turning in the scripture here to Isaiah 49 verse one. And it says in the New King James um, version, it says, opening words, from the womb of your mother, I have named your name. Mm -hmm. I, I froze. I'm like holding here unnamed, and here I'm reading in the scripture, from the womb of your mother, I have wow. named my name. And then I felt the Holy Spirit say, Christine, you're looking at two black and white ink on paper here. I've got the Department of Community Service document here. I've got the Word of God here. Both are black and white ink on paper. Both are, are 
there they are. They're, they're just sitting there. One is the facts and one is the truth. And somehow in that moment, I felt a sense from God, Christine, where you place your faith in this moment is going to determine the entire next season of your life. Are you going to place your faith in the facts of what the document you just got from the government or are you gonna place your faith in the truth of my word? And I just remember I'm bawling my eyes out. Um, I'm sitting there in that living room by myself holding two bits of black and white ink on paper. And it was in that moment that I chose to believe the truth about my identity. The facts were staring me. The facts were unnamed 2508 of 1966. But the truth was from the womb of your mother, I have named your name. And by placing my faith that my identity is in the fact that God has named my name um, before, when I was in my mother's womb. And in fact, before I even got in that womb, he knew me and he knitted together my innermost parts and he fashioned all of my day. What could have been decades of therapy, decades of being messed up about my identity and my value and my worth. This is the only way I can say it. In that split second, and I can't over-dramatise this because that is what happened, that truth of Isaiah 49.1, which I still have, you know, I wish I had the courage to have a tattoo, but I'm too scared of pain. <laughs> but if I did, I would tattoo Isaiah 49 verse 1 from the womb of your mother, from the matrix of your mother, it says in the King James, from the matrix of your mother, I have named your name. It's like God's promise to me, Christine, whatever they say about you, whatever they call you, even if you were unnamed, number 2508 of 19, I named you in your mother's womb. It was life defining and life transformative in my life. I think every person that's watching this today knows that moment where are we going to agree with God about who he says we are? Or are we going to agree with the world because we have facts that back it up? And that is, I just know that. I remember being in a counselor's office many years ago and she said to me, you know, Havila, you have an issue of, and this is years ago, but she said, you have an issue of identity. And I said, I don't know, what do you mean? She said, well, you've gotten mixed up in your value of what where your value comes from. And I said, well, can you explain it to me? I don't, I don't know how I got it wrong. I think I know, I know what's right. And she said, well, you've, you've gotten uh, confused between what your value is and your effectiveness. She said, your value never changes. I'll never forget the story. I don't know if she came up with it or not. I'm sure it's been told before. But she said, if you're walking along the road and you found a brand new penny, and then you walked a few more steps and you found a beat up penny, how much value would each of the pieces of, of income, you know, what, what would they be? Well, they would be the exact same. Why? One looks brand new and one looks like it's been beat up and spit out. Why would they have the same value? And she said, because it's not how they look that holds the value. The value comes from the one that created it. They, they because we decided that pennies would be a penny, it'd be worth the same. It didn't matter what the look was. And she said, this is how we as people of faith, we get really messed up where we think we're adding value to our lives and we're going to church and reading the books and watching Better Together and singing the songs and giving the money. And we think we're adding value and we're mm -hmm. adding some sense of, of worthiness. And yet she's like, no, all we're adding is effectiveness. We want to be effective to help the kingdom um, and to build the kingdom, but our value will never change. I can go to heaven with my son and I could, we could both get into heaven and God could say, daughter, she, you know, he doesn't say prophetess, right. you know, preacher, author, come into the kingdom and bring that kid behind you that can barely wipe his butt, bring him too. <laughs> no, he's like son and daughter because value was decided before we ever hit the earth. And I'll tell you what, Chris, even as you're talking about it, as somebody who you would think would know her value, uh, that took me a long time to understand. I did not get it. I somehow thought I was getting God's attention by what I was adding to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And it took me getting flat on my back with postpartum depression, landing in a, in, a, in a counselor's office as an ordained minister, knowing that I was in trouble and knowing I didn't know what to do, thinking I have every tool I should have. I preach, I pray, I prophesy, I, I've done it all. 
and I, I'm having a value issue. I don't know where I belong in the kingdom. I don't know what I add or how to not add by to my value. And that was a lesson that changed my life forever. It was my moment, again, and not as, as extraordinary as yours, but it was my moment of what the world said and what the Bible said about me. And I had to make a choice. Was I gonna believe what God said about me or am I gonna believe the value that people give me? And I'm always in a battle of that. I don't know about you guys, but the world is yeah. constantly trying to add value. Oh, you're the one. Oh, you did this. Oh, I love that message. Oh, I love this. And they're trying to add that you have value and you have to say, it, it doesn't matter. You could, the crowd is never right. The crowd was never right about Jesus. And they're never gonna be right about me. My value is the exact same whether I never do another thing for God, my value will never be altered because it is who he says I am. And my value comes from my Holy Spirit DNA that God created me and formed me well before anyone knew me. What I was thinking of is, my teenagers, um, you know, all of us at varying levels of our lives, we go through a season where we are going to call into question, yeah. where we're, we're trying to attach ourselves and our knowing, the, the Holy Spirit in us, whether we're agreeing with him or not, we're trying to attach to something that we actually believe in. There's a point at which, you know, children will stop believing what their parents say. Oh, you always say that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know. And so because what they're doing is they're saying, separate from you, what do I believe? Separate from what you told me or how you've lived, what do I actually believe? And so in that scenario, we kind of, we kind of at different parts in our lives, I think, find that we, we are trying to attach from what everybody said which means we're kind of floating for a little bit. I think all of us have a season of our lives where we can identify with feeling unknown um, because we no longer are connected with our parents or maybe we're not connected with our spouse or maybe those friends aren't our friends anymore. Maybe this community worked for a little while, but now somehow we don't fit. And we're, we're constantly saying, okay, what can I attach myself to? And, and here's the problem. The enemy knows that, which is why he stirs up the noise. Yeah. You were talking, yeah. you know, Havila, about how everybody's got something to say. Well, the, the enemy knows that in the midst of a lot of voices, we can be confused. So he always wants to add his voice to the mix to give us more information than what we need when the only voice that we need to attach ourselves to is the Lord. So he comes into the Garden of Eden and he says to Eve, let me give you something else to think about. Let me give you, let me plant a seed of what you can mow on for a little bit because maybe if I confuse, uh, maybe if I confuse you with another voice, I can detach you from the name that God has given you. And what we find and when you fast forward to the New Testament and Jesus is here, anytime there was too much noise, too many crowds, too much going on, you can always find the story of Jesus peppered with, there were crowds and then he was alone. Yeah. There were crowds yeah. and then he was alone. You know, he gets by himself. He goes to the mountain to pray. He backs up from the crowd into a boat. Because what Jesus knew and what we have to always remember is that the only one skilled enough to give us a name when we feel unknown or when the crowds are busy or the devil is busy peppering the air with noise yeah. to confuse us, the only way that we can go from being unknown to known, from being un misunderstood to being understood, to having no name to having a name is to connect with the one who is the only one who knows what the name is he's given us. And so I think what you have to say is when you are feeling like you're not quite sure what your name is, when you're feeling unknown, because I think as women, I, particularly, I think that's through various seasons of life, how we're going to find ourselves feeling like, I don't even know who I am right now. I mean, I literally at 12, it's a story that I've told a million times where I literally said to my parents, I was crying and my mom was like, what's wrong? And my dad is looking at me like, what's going on? And I just was like, I don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. And they both kind of froze for a second. My mom had her hand on her earring and she was <laughs> taking it out. And she kind of looked at me like this and my dad had his hand on his tie like they froze in time for like 10 seconds and then my mother says what do you mean like they were totally confused by my confusion and my dad was like you don't know who you are like here's your name but what I was saying in that moment is you gave me a name and in this season of my life I don't feel connected to that name and here's the other problem is we allow our feelings 
to dictate whether or name our name is truth, whether or not our name, the name God gave us is truth. And we are allowing the noise from the earth to pepper with facts that don't agree with that. So I just think it's okay to feel unknown. It's okay for other people not to know your name. What's not okay is for you to think that you're going to actually find your correct name anywhere else than what Jesus is calling you. Yeah. Wow. You know, I love that. I love the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She's unnamed. And Jesus turns around in the crowd and says, who touched me? And so this woman that has lived for 12 years and has been pushed aside to die, that was her identity. She had the issue of blood. She was a, a complete outcast in the world back then. So, so she was Jewish. She was bleeding. She was everything against her for 12 years. And Jesus says, daughter. And he gave her the name daughter. And, you know, I doubt that life for her just immediately got better. Mm-hmm. I doubt that, I mean, she had to undo 12 years of sickness and outcast and and reintegrating with society and family and you know there was there was drama to her story but she with her faith she said if i can touch the hem of his garment so here's an outcast. She was the lowest of the low. So no matter how you feel today, you might say, I am so undeserving. Yeah. I am such on the bottom. I am so beneath sea level. I have nothing going for me today. I have been labeled loser, everything you can possibly think of. If you could just think that maybe you could reach out with your faith. And I love to I love to say this. If the Bible was being written today, is there somebody that could reach out and touch the hem of his garment like she did? Is there somebody that could reach out with their faith and just say, I need a new name. I need a new identity and latch on to what God says about you. To latch on to I am a daughter If there's nothing else you can reach for, you can reach for, I am a daughter of the living God. And 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 he's got better for me. He's got good plans for me. He's got goodness in my future. He's got healing for me. So many of us, I think, identify with with they've lost their job. You know, I'm I'm not needed anymore. I've got this sickness. I've I'm I'm I've got cancer, I've got this, I've got that. And they identify with the things that are against them. And if if you could just for a moment, it just takes that much of faith. And everybody's got it. Everybody has that little bit of faith that it takes. He said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say, I am a child of God. And I believe you can see things turn around for your good. You can see things start speaking out of your mouth. I will be a witness. I am a witness of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And see things change. I believe that her world was tipped upside down because she said, if I can touch him, I can be healed. Lori, the way that I heard it was that we all are given assignments. Our yeah. identity stays the same. So I'm a child of God. I'm worthy. I'm covered in the righteousness of Christ. Uh, you know, but my assignment will shift. And the issue we have as women, even like, let's be honest, us girls, we tend to think I'm a mother. That's my identity. I'm a wife. That's why I'm a business owner. I'm a pastor, I, whatever. That's who I am. And, and really, when we wrap our hands around an assignment, we get in trouble. But if we right. go, you know what, for the season I'm in, I'm anointed to do this. Yes. This is my assignment. But my, my identity is not going to ever change, but my assignments will shift. That was revolutionary for me. And I often think that for some reason, some ways it helps me know, okay, I'm not going to be here forever, which is really great. But other times I have to go, okay, is this my identity now? Is this who I'm becoming? Or am I still the same person anywhere I go? That's really important. I overheard our worship leader, her name is Rachel, say to our worship team recently, because like most musicians, they're very talented. Our vocalists are very talented. But she said to them, and I thought it was very profound, and she said, your um, gifts are accessories, 
but they're not your identity. Your identity is found in Christ. And I think if we look at our gifts and our roles and our talents and all that God has trusted us with as accessories, um, it's actually freeing. I think we get in trouble when we find what we do as our identity, which is a common theme of what we've all been talking about today. And I think that's why we we fall, that's why we get overwhelmed because it's not meant for us to find our identity in our roles. It's meant for us to find our identity in Christ because he's the only one that can sustain us. And I love that how Chris, you started this off talking about when you had that moment, you actually went to scripture. And I think so many times in this last couple of years, many of us have felt lost, like Crystal was talking about, like we've all talked about. Many of us have felt like, who am I? But the key is going to scripture. And I think we're forgetting to go to scripture and we're going to social media. I see it all the time and we're feeling so lost. It's just like this book I used to read to my kids when they were little called, you know, Are You My Mother? And um, <laughs> they were going to these different animals, like this was a little bird yeah. going to an elephant. Are you my mother? Then the bird would go to a crocodile. Are you my mother? And look to find their identity. And I feel like as a generation, we're going to the wrong thing saying, are you my mother? Are you my mother? Are you my mother? We're going to Netflix. Are you my mother? Facebook. Are you my mother? Self-help book. Are you my mother? Instead of going to the source, going to scripture, going to Jesus to find out who we are, because he's the one who can define us. And when we rest in that, it gives us such peace. Otherwise, we'll be on a quest like that little bird wonder, asking the wrong thing, are they our mother? Yeah. Wow. That's so good. You know, I think that, you know, I think about Moses and when he was talking to, to, to God, God in Exodus 3, you know, and 4 is telling Moses, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses has all these questions, you know, here are my insecurities. Here's what I'm wondering. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions he asked God was, who should I say sent me? Mm. And, and God's response was, I am. You tell them <laughs> I am that I am sent. That, it's not about what I can do. It's not about what I can achieve. Right. It's not about uh, me telling you about my history or telling you about your future. It's about the fact that I am. And the power that I'm giving you to operate in is because I am. Before you ever do a thing, mm -hmm. it's about this fact that I've imparted my power to you. You know, you think about M, right, is a state of being verb. It's, it's not a verb that's an action verb. You're not doing anything. It's about being. And I think that often what we're trying to do is we've, y'all have so eloquently said all throughout this episode of the show is that we try to find our M in our do, mm. you know? And the thing is, is yeah. there is a power just like God as a you know as an infinite being is all powerful omnipotent God says my power comes from who I am not what I do mm -hmm. and I think we need to understand that our value does not come from what we do it comes from who we are and how do we know who we are well I am who God says that I am right. So, it, you know, it comes back to that woman touching the hem of Jesus's garment yeah. and saying, if I can just touch you, what I need is in who you are. You don't even have to talk to me, Jesus. You don't have to yeah. do anything. I just need to touch you. And if the, if who you are can be imparted to me and who I am, I will be made whole. Let me just tell you something. If you're in Christ, you are seated at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places with Christ yeah. Jesus. You have access to every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. I just want you to hear this. If you are already seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, Honey, you can't go any higher. Right. It doesn't matter how big your brand is, That's how it. many blue check marks you've got, how many followers, <laughs> you can't go higher. You are at the right hand of the Father, is seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So when you get that and you get a full revelation of that identity, there is only one place to go. And that means we step down into a lost and a broken world, secure in our identity in Christ, giving an overflow of all that we have access to in Christ to bring hope and healing and life and redemption to the lost and broken world around us. The greatest revelation you will ever have is to know who you are in Christ, where you're seated in Christ, what you have in Christ. Then you can become the hands and feet of Jesus in the midst of a lost and a broken world being light in the darkness. So let me pray for all of us today. Father, I thank You. I thank You that truly You know each and every person, Lord, on the other side of the screen. And Lord, no one's a number. I just think of that moment when I was holding that birth certificate and it just had a number, not even a name. And Lord, in that moment, You spoke to me so clearly through Your Word. From the womb of Your mother, I've named Your name. Lord, let every person 
know that they are seen, that they are known, that you know them, that you love them, that you have chosen them. And Father, let us all truly know what it is at the very, in the marrow of our bones, that what it is to have our identity rooted and grounded in you. Yeah. And for that, we give you praise and glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. And it's because of you that partner with us that this ministry continues. God bless you.